All right, so uh, last class, um, last class we looked at the majority of the F tests that fall out of a two-way ANOVA experiment. Okay, so we basically studied um, the three, well, we studied three F tests that can be utilized after running a two-way ANOVA. In total, there are actually four F tests. So there's the model utility test. There is the test of interaction. Um, sorry, one sec. So there's the model utility test. There is the test of interaction. And then there are the two main effect tests. In each case, the way that we run the tests, as we can actually see from our previous examples, are more or less analogous to how we would run any F test. The difference is just what we are asking on each of the different steps of the test. So the difference is just what we are asking um, on each of the steps of the test. So for example, in the model utility test, we are essentially asking for the general test um, of any treatment effect within the entire system. And when I say the entire system, I mean across the main effect levels, which in the example that we were working with would be the golf brand level and the golf club level and across the treatment combinations, which are the interactions between the levels of the golf ball brand in this context and the levels of the club type, again, in this context. So the model utility test effectively asks, is there any evidence of a difference or an effect anywhere in this entire system? Okay. Um, now, once we conduct the model utility test, the next step is to um, determine if we should run the test of interaction. So the model utility test is basically like a precursor for running each of the different tests in the two-way ANOVA table. So our model utility test, if we reject the null hypothesis, is basically acting as a, a check to see if we should continue to perform the tests that fall out of the table directly. So the next test that we would conduct in, in terms of the procedure that we introduced is the test of interaction. Following from the test of interaction, we test for the main effects. So golf ball brand and for club type. So on slides 28 and 29, we have all of those different F tests. And again, those are um, performed in the same way as any F test we've seen in this course. So the same way we ran F tests for the one way ANOVA and the same way we ran F tests for the block design just that what we're asking is slightly different in these cases. Okay, after we run those F tests, if we reject the null hypothesis of say the interaction test or the main effects tests, we then go and um, we would then want to conduct multiple comparisons. So following from a two-way ANOVA, we would actually have sets of multiple comparisons that we would be interested in conducting. So we would have a set of multiple comparisons for each of the different effects that we tested and gave evidence of um, a difference. So for example, if we test factor A and we reject the null hypothesis of no treatment effect for factor A, we would do a multiple comparison for factor A for the factor A levels exclusively. If for factor B, we had the same result, so we rejected the null hypothesis of no effect from factor across the factor B levels. Then we would um, conduct the multiple comparisons for the factor B levels exclusively. And then similarly for the interaction effect, if we conduct a hypothesis test of the interaction and we reject the null hypothesis, then the um, then we would then go and test the means across each of the treatment combination levels. 
All right, so on slides 30 and 31, we work through the illustrations of how to compute the margins of errors for each of the different types of multiple comparisons we would want to perform. From the two-way ANOVA analysis of this particular experiment, we determined that there was evidence that we should reject the null hypothesis for both main effects, which again are club type and golf ball brand, and for the treatment combination means, which are the interactions between the levels of the two main effects. The way that our multiple comparisons work will be identical to the way that we have performed a multiple comparison in the past, with again, the only exception being that we have a separate set of multiple comparisons for each main effect and for each treatment effect. So once we compute the margin of error, our next goal would be to um, our next goal would be to calculate the mean difference between the means for the levels of the main effect and for the means of the treatment combination levels. Then we would compare the absolute difference of those means to the margin of error. If the absolute difference of the means is larger than the margin of error, then the corresponding confidence interval will not contain zero and we would reject or we would say that there's significant evidence of a difference there. Now for this particular illustration, we've seen multiple examples of how to run these multiple comparisons in the past. So in this particular case, we have the results from the multiple comparison being summarized using these line graphs. So what we're doing now is we're basically just using the line graphs or these charts to determine where the significant differences lie. But again, all of the results here follow from the same procedures that we studied before with the only difference being that we're using, we have an exclusive set of multiple comparisons for the brand means, an exclusive set of multiple comparison for the club mean, and an exclusive set of multiple comparisons for the treatment combination means. Okay, so we read these diagrams um, by looking for pairs of main effect levels that do not or are not connected by a line. So for example, in the first plot for brand, so we're looking at this plot right now, A, B are connected. B, A and C are connected, A and D are connected. So that indicates that the treatment means for A, B are, there's evidence that they are the same. The treatment means for A, C, there are evidence that they are the same. And the treatment means for AD, there's evidence that they are the same. Or what I should say is there's no evidence that they are different. Similarly, the treatment means for B and C, though there's no evidence that those are different either. So we do not have uh, B and D being connected or C and D being connected in this diagram. So we can say at the 5% significance level, there is evidence of a difference between average distance traveled by golf ball brands B and D or between um, golf ball brands B and D and C and D. Okay. All right, similarly, for the club type, you can see our diagram is shown here. We have treatment and then we had two types of clubs. So this multiple comparison is actually just a standard t-test of the difference between two means because we only have two means in this particular or two levels to consider for this particular main effect. So you can see that there's no line connecting the driver and the five iron. So here we would say at the five percent significance level the data provide sufficient evidence to suggest that the average distance traveled by balls hit by either a driver or five iron differ. 
So basically we're just saying that the average distance a golf ball travels when it's hit by a driver is significantly different than the average distance a golf ball travels when it's hit by a five iron, which if you've played golf before is a pretty reasonable expectation considering that the driver is the club you would usually use first for most standard length holes. It's the club that hits the bar the farthest and the five iron is a middle of a packed iron. So it has a fair amount of loft on it and it's not really meant to, um, it is a longer iron. So the ball would travel further, but it certainly wouldn't travel as far as a driver. So this is not, this is the kind of result that if you went back and reported to someone, they'd be like, thanks. That's, um, that's new information for me. <laughs> okay. The last set of comparisons, um, are the comparisons of the treatment combination means. So in this set of comparisons, we are comparing all of the different possible combinations across the levels of the experiment. So there are eight different treatment combinations which are listed at the top of the chart. Now we're gonna use this plot in the same way we did before. The first thing that we can observe is that there are no lines connecting any driver type to any five iron type. So this automatically off the start is showing us a separation between the average distance driven by the driver and the average distance driven by the five iron, which again is not a surprising result given that the driver should be a longer club than the five iron. So the first result we can say is at the 5% significance level, there is sufficient evidence to suggest that balls hit by the driver have an average distance traveled that differs from balls hit by a five iron. Okay, so that's one of the initial conclusions. Again, this is just the same main effect conclusion that we had before, but this is something that is being pointed out by the diagrams. Okay, so we see no connection between the, any of the driver combinations and any of the five iron combinations. Okay, now we can start to parse this apart. So notice when we start reading the diagram here, so I'll call this one number one, we have a connection between driver A and driver B. Number two shows us a connection between driver A and driver D. So we can say at the 5% significance level, we have, or sorry, the data provide evidence sufficient evidence to suggest that the average distance traveled by the golf balls differs between Okay, and now what we can do is just start listing them, um, each of the different combinations. So we have the general opening statement here, at the 5% significance level, the data provides sufficient evidence to suggest that the average distance traveled by the golf balls differs between, and then we would say driver A and driver C. So we can see that driver times A and driver times C um, do not have a line connecting them, so that indicates a difference. So this would be one, uh, one of the differences. Okay, now if we continue, we can see driver B and driver C are connected. We can see driver B and driver D are connected and we can see driver C and driver D are connected. So the only evidence of a difference between the treatment combinations within the driver set 
are driver A and driver C, which indicates that there's something about golf ball A versus golf ball C that can create a difference in the amount of yards collected when hit by the driver. Now we can do the same thing for the five iron. So we can see for the five iron, A and B are connected, A and C are connected, A and D are connected, and C and D are connected. So the only thing missing here is five iron times B and five iron times uh, C. A, B, A, C. A, D, C, D. Yeah, so we're just missing B, C and B, D. Okay. Does anyone have any questions? Okay. Okay. So that brings us to the end of the um, analysis part of the two-way ANOVA design. So again, we have basically our standard set of hypothesis tests with the inclusion of that overall model utility test to start off the testing procedure. Following each of the individual tests from the ANOVA table, we can then conduct separate sets of multiple comparisons for each main effect and for the, treat, uh, the interaction effect. All right, the last thing that we have to do is talk about how we can assess the assumptions of the um, two-way ANOVA procedure. Now, the assumptions of the two-way ANOVA procedure are effectively the same as the assumptions of the one-way ANOVA procedure and the assumptions of the um, completely randomized block design. The first two assumptions are that we collect independent, simple random samples. That can be verified using experimental design. The last two assumptions are that we have constant variance across all treatment combinations and that we have normality um, or, or that all observations are normally distributed. Now to check for normality, we can do the same thing that we did in the case of the completely randomized block design and the one-way ANOVA. We can construct estimates of the residual terms, which are shown in the table on slide 34, and then we can create a QQ plot of these residual terms. If that QQ plot um, dem it shows a linear relationship, then we can say there's evidence that the variable of interest is normally distributed. So you'll notice here that I have in red, verify. So each of these residual calculations, you're being asked to check on your own using the two-way ANOVA model the raw data given on slide three and the table of means that was given uh, four or five, given about four or five slides back from here. Okay. Now, in general, residual conduct or residual construction for a two-way ANOVA will usually be done through software, anyways. So, for example, SPSS is something that we can utilize to to um, calculate the residuals of any ANOVA experiment. But each of these residuals can also be found simply by rearranging the two-way ANOVA expression, similar to how we did in the one-way ANOVA case, except that we would have different um, means available to us. Okay, so in the first plot here, we have the normal probability plot of the residual terms. 
So we can see that this normal probability plot follows a straight line relationship with the quantiles of the normal distribution. In the second plot, we have plotted the residuals against their mean values. So this plot, although it looks a little bit unorganized, is effectively a collection of four residual points being lined up at each of their different corresponding means. So we have a set where I drew the first line. We have a second set here. We have a third set here, a fourth set here. Okay, and then in this plot, we have a set here. We have a set here. We have a set here. And we have a set here. Okay, so the idea here is that we are, sorry, one second. Uh, sorry. Okay. So the second plot here stacks each of the collections of residuals at their treatment combination mean. This dot plot is essentially being used to compare the range across that group of residuals. So the idea is if we have a consistent variance across all treatment combinations, each of the links from smallest to lowest value in this plot should be the same. Okay, so we're basically comparing, um, we're comparing, well, I'll write it separately here. We are comparing each vertical length. Okay, so we have eight different vertical lengths. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And we're comparing these lengths to see if there's, uh, to see if subjectively speaking, of course, they are the same. Now, I think that in this case, we can all agree that in studying this plot, it's very clear that length two, which is the longest length, is much greater than length one, which is the shortest length. In fact, if we compare the standard deviation of length two to length one, we find that the ratio of those standard deviations is 4.724, which is basically saying that the standard deviation of the four residuals in the second group is almost five times larger than the standard deviation of the four residuals in the first group. Okay, so since, or we can say then, this plot gives no evidence to suggest that the standard deviation or variance of each population is the same, okay? So because these ranges are so different from each other, this is basically implying to us that each group of treatment combinations or, or each group of residuals have different standard deviations, which implies that the standard deviation assumption is not uh, constant as it's supposed to be for this experiment. Further here, since 4.724 is greater than two, we have evidence of a difference, sorry, of a difference in standard or in variances. So this is an application of both the rule of two and of just a, a visual comparison of the ranges of each of the different groups. Now we could do the same thing using um, box plots, for example. And we can check to see if the range of those box plots are equivalent. Um, but in this case, we just use the dot plot diagram, but it would be the same idea as using box plots.
Okay, so that brings us to the end of the ANOVA unit. In the ANOVA unit, three types of ANOVAs were tested or were studied. The one-way ANOVA, the two-way ANOVA, and the completely randomized block design. The one-way ANOVA and the completely randomized block design will be the subject of lecture quiz number two, which is on Monday. In addition to studying the differences and similarities between these two types of ANOVA, you'll also be interested in reviewing how multiple comparison and um, assumption checking work for each of these procedures. So that will make up um, the majority of what quiz two is going to be asking you about. Now that we finished studying two-way ANOVA, we're going to move on to the next unit in the course, which is on non-parametric statistics. So non-parametric statistics start in lecture set number eight. In this lecture set, we are going to study what is called the sign test. The sign test is a non-parametric test that acts as an alternative to a one sample t-test. The motivation for this unit is to learn about hypothesis testing procedures that we can utilize when the normality assumption is not intact. So you may have noticed throughout this course that we have made a, an assumption about the distribution of the observations that we are working with. When we attach a normality assumption to a set of data that we have collected, we are actually setting up what is called parametric hypothesis testing. The reason that we refer to these as parametric hypothesis tests is because the normal distribution has two parameters associated with it, the mean and the standard deviation. And we are assuming that we have, or that we can estimate these parameters and that they describe the population that is of interest to us. Now, most often, and we've seen lots of examples of this throughout the course and through lab, we know that that normality assumption is not always reasonable. Many times, the residual values deviate from the linear pattern that we would expect when studying a normal probability plot. So this set of material um, is meant to give us an alternative to the one sample hypothesis testing procedures um, that we studied back in lecture set two. So effectively, when normality is not reasonable, we are going to learn about ways that we can continue to ask the same questions and study the same, um, well, ways that we can ask the same questions about population parameters, but without requiring that normality assumption. Okay. okay. Now, what is it about a population being non-normal that is detrimental to the hypothesis testing procedures that we have seen before? Well, let's suppose that we have a distribution of, we have the, the variable of interest has the, dis the density curve shown on slide number three here. So this is the density curve of the distribution that represents the population values of interest. So this is clearly a non-normal distribution. Okay. Now, if we do not collect a large enough sample, we know that we do not, we know that the central limit theorem will not give us protection against the fact that this is non-normal. So what does this actually mean? Well, when we conduct a hypothesis test in the parametric setting, so when we use either the standard normal table or the student's T table to perform a hypothesis test, on step three of the procedure, we compute a test statistic. That test statistic is going to follow either the standard normal distribution or the student T distribution which is why we are able to use those particular tables to find either critical values or p-values and then assess essentially the probability that the null hypothesis is true in the particular situation of interest. 
when we have a population that is not normally distributed, like the right skew distribution that we saw on slide three, if we collect a sample, say, of size eight or some sample that's less than 30, the distribution of, this, of the test statistic will no longer be standard normal or student T. So it's actually the distribution of the test statistic that relies or that we, um, we, we oh, sorry, sort of the distribution of the test statistic being st standard normal or student T is the, let's say, key ingredient to the reliability of the hypothesis test that we are conducting. So if we have something that's right skewed, like we do on the previous slide, and we collect a sample of size eight, then you can see that the distribution of the test statistic in this case is actually non-normal. It's actually kind of like left skewed in this case, very slightly, but still. However, if you have this right skewed population, you collect a sample of size eight from it and you just conduct the test in the usual way. So using a Z score or a student T value, you are assuming that this is the distribution of the test statistic. So assuming this is distribution of test. Statistic. But we can see that the actual distribution of the test statistic is this sort of left skewed object that we have in the second panel here, right? So this is panel one, and this is panel two. So the problem is, let's say that we get our test statistic on step three, and that value is uh, t equals 2.65. If we use the, if the distribution of the test statistic is actually student T, then we can use the test statistic to find a probability that, uh, or to find a, a P value that would be reliable. But if the distribution of the test statistic is not actually students T, and it's something like what we have in the second panel here, that when, then when we go to find that probability, we're essentially going to be looking in the wrong place for that particular uh, p-value, I should have said not. So probability means p-value. So there's a chance that by using the student's t curve, well, actually, it's not just a chance. If that normality assumption is not intact and we do not collect enough information from the population, we're going to be using the student's t curve or the standard normal curve to find a p-value or critical value when those distributions are not actually the distributions of the test statistic in that particular case. So essentially, it boils down to us using evidence um, that's unrelated to the case that we are studying, if you will. Okay, so you want to make a decision about a particular null hypothesis. You want to use your test statistic as evidence. But when you go to use your test statistic as evidence, you're looking up a p-value or a critical value in the wrong place, which means that that evidence is not useful for that particular problem. So those assumptions that we place on um, the distribution of the population that we are studying, they are there so that we can be certain that the test statistic is following either the standard normal or student T distribution. So when it is impossible for us to actually um, validate that normality assumption in particular, the main consequence is that the distribution of the test statistic is not going to be students T or standard normal. And therefore using those tables to find the p-value or critical value would be um, inappropriate and incorrect. Okay, so it follows that if the normality assumption cannot be verified and a suitable transformation cannot be utilized, but we're not really going to talk about transformations, then 
we need a procedure to continue to conduct inference, or we need a procedure that we can use to conduct inference. And we need those procedures to not make such a strict assumption about the population. So in particular, we need a procedure that does not assume normality of the population that we are studying. Okay. So our non-parametric statistical tests are distributional uh, are free of the distributional assumption. So these are sets of hypothesis tests that do not assume normality. So compared to the parametric tests, the non-parametric tests do um, have this have limited distributional assumptions. Okay, so they're not as strict in terms of assumptions. They are based on ranks of the data. So they actually utilize um, another classification of the data. So rather than taking the raw values themselves and computing say a mean and the standard deviation, we tend to rank the data from smallest to largest in value. And then we operate on the ranks directly. Okay. So these tests can also be used um, when analyzing um, what would be called ordinal data. So ordered categorical data um, where well, period. They can be utilized when analyzing ordinal data, where the, the parametric tests, it wouldn't be as appropriate. The drawback, though, is that the non-parametric tests are not as powerful as the parametric tests. When we say power, we mean in this, I mean in the statistical sense. So you might recall that the probability of type to error is equal to the probability that you fail to reject H0 given H0 is false. Power is equal to one minus probability of type to error, which is the probability that you reject H0 given H0 is false. Okay, so when we use these non-parametric tests, what we do give up is power in the statistical sense, which means that the probability that we reject the false null is smaller for the not for the non-parametric test than it is for the parametric test. So if we had to choose between them, if if we had the normality assumption in place and we could take either the parametric or non-parametric route, we would choose the parametric test because they have a, they have a higher power than the non-parametric tests. But if that normality assumption is not intact, then we obviously cannot use those procedures that rely on normality because we would be um, looking for evidence in the wrong place. So in those cases, we would want to use the non-parametric tests and take that reduction in power um, such that we can make the right decision about the null hypothesis. Okay, so we are going to study in this lecture set the sign test. In total, we're going to talk about four different non-parametric tests. So the sign test, the sign rank test, uh, the Wilcoxon rank sum test, and the Kruskal Wallace test. The sign test is an alternative to the one sample t test. And essentially what we're going to see are alternatives to the two sample t test and to the one way ANOVA. The sign test sets up a null and alternative hypothesis that are used to make a decision about the center of the distribution. So although, um, well, so the sign test, instead of testing the mean directly, it actually tests the median. So eta zero, which is shown here, okay. This is actually the population median for the distribution. Now the rationale for this is, if the distribution is not symmetric, then the median is still the representation of the center or the median still lies at the center. 
So we know that from previous studies, the median is robust to outlying points and it's robust to asymmetry effectively. So the median will always be at the midpoint of the distribution. Now, if the distribution is symmetrical, the median and the mean will be at the same point because we know that they exist, they both sit at the middle when the distribution is symmetric. So in that sense, the median is a better representation of the center because it stays at the center regardless of the shape of the population. The sign test makes no distributional assumption about the data. Okay, so we are free to run this test in pretty much any situation. The test statistic here is calculated using a count of the values that are above or below the hypothesized median. And we'll see examples of how this works in a bit. But effectively, we rank the data, and then we just count how many of them are above the hypothesized median. All right. All right. So like every hypothesis test, the sign test can be conducted in six steps. Okay. So we have no distributional assumptions, but we do assume that a simple random sample was collected before we conduct the sign test. The six te steps of the sign test are step one, state the null and alternative hypotheses. These will be of three types, but they will all be about the population median. So we have the lower tailed, the upper tailed, or the two tailed test about the population median. On step two, we would declare a significance level for the test. On step three, we will compute the test statistic for the sign test. On step four, we're going to compute the p-value. Now, computation of the p-value is different from how we've seen p-value computation in the past because we are using the binomial distribution in this case with probability of success 0.5. So we're going to review the binomial probability formula when we work through the steps of this test. But in the next lecture set, we'll introduce the signed rank test and the signed rank test is um, the preferred alternative to the one sample test, but we need to define the sign test before we get there. So the computation of the p-value for the sign test, although it will seem um, a bit tedious, it's not something that we need to worry about too much as we progress through the material. And then on step five, we make our decision about the null and about the null. And then on step six, we conclude. So it's a standard hypothesis test in terms of number of steps. Again, we have two types of hypotheses for the sign, or three hypotheses that are possible for a sign test. The two-tailed, upper-tailed, and lower-tailed tests are all applicable here. The only difference is that we are talking about the population median rather than the population mean. So you can see that the forms of the three tests are the same, but in each case, we have eta rather than nu because we are not going to be directly discussing the population mean. Okay, so the test statistic for the sign test is a count of the number of values that are greater than or less than the hypothesized median. So we let little s plus count the number of values that are greater than the hypothesized median, and we let little s negative count the number of values that are less than the hypothesized median. So in the case of the upper tail test, our test statistic will be the count of the number of values that are greater than the hypothesized median. In the lower tail test case, the um, test statistic will be the count of the number of values that are less than the hypothesized median. And in the two tail test case, the test statistic will be the count of either the number of values that are less than the hypothesized median or the number of values that are larger than the hypothesized median where we take the value that is larger in that case. If the null hypothesis is true, we can expect that the, we expect that these counts will follow the binomial distribution. So our P value will be computed using the binomial probability formula, which is given in equation one. So essentially what we're gonna be asking here is, what is the probability of observing a count that is at least as large as the one that we did observe when we conducted the test? So our binomial probability formula is going to be utilized to find the probability that x is greater than or equal to either s plus or s negative, um, or less than or equal to s negative in the case of a lower tail test. <clears throat> 
actually it's 0 0.5 is p so i think we can always go greater than or equal to because uh it's symmetric at 0 0.5 Okay, yeah. So we were, I was being strict. Never mind. Right. So, um, <clears throat> so effectively, what we're going to say is there's evidence in fa or there's evidence to reject the null hypothesis if either S negative or F S plus are much larger than the other. So essentially, if S negative and S plus are very similar, so if S negative is five and S plus is five, we would expect the null hypothesis to be correct. But if S negative is very different from S plus, like say S negative is eight and S plus is two, then that would likely give evidence against null hypothesis. Similarly, um, in the cases of the directional tests, we would expect S plus to be much larger than S negative if there's evidence that the hypothesized median is greater than the pre-established value. In the case of the lower tail test, we would expect S negative to be larger than S plus if there's evidence that the hypothesized median is actually, or if the population median is less than the hypothesized value. And in each case, we're gonna, con again, compute the p-values using the binomial probability formula, where for the upper tail test and for the um, two-tail test, we'd find the probability that S is larger than or equal to the observed test statistic. And in the lower tail test, we'd find the probability that S is less than the observed test statistic. However, again, I'm confident that we can do all of these as upper tail calculations because at 0 0.5, um, the binomial distribution is symmetric. Okay, so um, I only have a, well, I'm actually out of time now. So on Wednesday, I'll review the steps of the sign test and then we'll work through the two examples. And then following that, we will um, look at the signed rank test, which is the subject of lecture set nine. Okay, so as a reminder, we have lecture quiz two on Monday and assignment number four, I believe is due uh, next, yeah, assignment four is due next Friday. Um, and that covers lecture set six and seven. Oh, and uh, I think uh, lecture lab assignment three is due on Monday as well, which is um, uh, the ANOVA and CRBD lecture set. So that would be lecture sets four, five, and six. All right, so if you guys have any questions, uh, please let me know. And um, otherwise, I will see you on Monday for the quiz, and then I'll talk to you on Wednesday, which will be our next actual lecture.